डॉक्टर अक्षय मेहता इज एन इंटरवेंशन कार्डियोलॉजिस्ट practicing at the juhu vilepale scheme for over 30 years he is affiliated to nanavati super specialty hospital bridge candy hospital holy family hospital and other hospitals he is the honorary secretary of the academy of cardiology at mumbai he has published several papers in peer review journals and has been very often invited to conferences as a faculty he has co-authored six books for cardiologists on cardiovascular diseases contributed several articles on heart on <clears throat> heart health in rotary news a rotary international magazine for south asia he is an active charter member of the rotary club of bombay airport the book on coronary heart disease for the layman named romancing the heart understanding preventing reversing and healing coronary heart disease that is to be launched today has endorsements from luminaries like amitabh bachan bk shivaji dr devi shetty sri sunil gavaskar and others welcome doctor okay thank you uh, rotarian burger uh, am i audible yes sir uh, okay yes you are yeah and uh, so uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all and thanks to uh, president vicky and district secretary kandar whom i call we call nikki uh, i have this privilege and the opportunity to uh, have this book launched and interact with you all for an important subject uh, i hope it helps everybody and everybody gets some benefit out of it uh so uh, first of all uh, uh, vicky uh, shall we show the book to uh, you have already shown but uh, maybe we uh, with uh, nikki maybe we can show it together so that uh, that becomes kind of a official launch thanks thanks nikki for coming yes uh, yeah uh, no i have invited uh, sunil also uh, dg sunil and he may be okay. joining us after a okay. while so oh, great we have a proper launch at when he okay joined. that time yeah okay fine fantastic thank you so much okay so uh, then if i may if i yeah. may add uh, uh, nikki yeah. is a uh, uh, he is he is the district secretary right and uh, he, he has been uh, with our club from the beginning and he has supported us all the way and yeah. he is almost like a proxy dg for us you know uh, thank great. you nikki for joining great. i'm proud you, because he is he is my club member so i am very proud of him anyway yeah yeah so thank you and uh, so shall i share the screen can uh, somebody allow me to share the screen so that yeah can... give me a moment one moment yeah 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 go ahead you can share screen now yeah yeah okay so we are going to have a romance with the heart our own hearts and which means uh, we are going to take care of our heart and give it the importance it deserves and uh, so with that view in mind i wrote this book and the uh, the various uh, questions which uh, patients have in what my experience of last 30 years have shown are all answered in this book questions like should i take aspirin every day uh, is cholesterol a myth should i always carry aspirin etc should can my blockages be removed without um, with just with medicines a lot of questions with patients have so those are answered but today uh, we i am going to just uh, focus on some key messages from the book which can help us uh, understand prevent and reverse and heal coronary artery disease which is a number one killer in india and and everywhere unfortunately in india it is the incidence is rising whereas in the high uh, high economic countries it is falling so we have a long lot of work to do in combating this disease so uh, let us start with a video clip and see what is happening is charlie's over here so uh, one fellow has collapsed maybe he read some news in the newspaper 
So he has collapsed. So, so what is this condition called? Well, this is uh, many times some people call this a heart attack, but this is not a heart attack. This is what is known as sudden cardiac arrest. And these two terms should be distinguished because the approach as, as, as public, as uh, non-doctors or non-medical people is uh, very important to differentiate. So, so then if this is cardiac arrest, then what is a heart attack? So to understand what is a heart attack, let us see the basic uh, structure of a heart, which is, we don't want to go much into details. As you all know from your school days, that heart is a muscular pump, which receives blood and pumps out blood. But to make it very simple, to understand coronary heart disease, let us follow this simple diagram, which shows a single chambered heart and uh, which has muscular walls, contains blood, and with every heartbeat, this muscular wall of the heart contracts and pumps out blood, which is contained in it, to the entire body through a large tube called the aorta. Now, like every muscle in the body, your forearm muscle, leg, all muscles, they require oxygen and nutrition. So the heart muscle also requires oxygen and nutrition, and it gets this oxygen and nutrition to the branches of the aorta, the first branches, which are called coronary arteries, which uh, lie over the surface and supply the muscle with oxygen and nutrition. So these coronary arteries are our lifelines, as you can see. They are most important for us. And they look like this over the surface of the heart muscle. Now, when we are born, we are born with arteries which are smooth and open if you slit them open or cut them into a section and they have a smooth lining and an open passage. But as we grow in some people due to certain risk factors like hypertension, diabetes, etc., fatty deposits are formed which narrow the lumen or the passage of the artery. Now, many times the passage is obstructed not too much, say 50%. This is called a 50% diameter reduction of coronary artery. That means there is a fatty buildup which narrows the diameter by about 50%. So whatever the narrowing, whether it is 25% or 30% or 50%, it doesn't matter. Till the narrowing is about 70 to 80%, the person does not recognize that he has a narrowing. He can walk about, he can work, his cardiogram is normal, but the narrowing is there, which is about 40 to 50%. So whatever the narrowing, it can suddenly become 100%. And how does that happen? That happens because sometimes this fatty plaque, the surface gets eroded or ruptures due to some reason, due to some kind of stress. And once that happens, the blood that is flowing gets clotted over there. And once it gets clotted, if the clot is big, the artery is completely blocked. As you can see, a, a mild narrowing has become severe narrowing within a minutes. And this is what happens when a person gets a heart attack. Okay. He's okay, but within a minute, within a few minutes, is this blockage occurs. And what happens when this blockage occurs? When this blockage occurs, the portion of heart muscle does not get blood, which was supplied by this artery. And that results in the chief symptom of heart attack, which is chest pain. So chest pain, uh, the characteristics of which we shall describe, suggests a heart attack, okay? And the important thing, going back to our diagram, is that though the blockage of the artery occurs over a few minutes, the ensuing damage to the heart muscle takes more than a few hours, six to 12 hours. And that damage is progressive from inside to outside. That means from the inner layers of the heart muscle to the outer layers of the heart muscle. So because it takes few hours, it gives us a window of opportunity. And the opportunity is opening the artery as soon as possible. If you open the artery by some means and supply the muscle with blood, if it is done, say, within one or two hours, then the damage will be very minimum and the heart will be as good as normal. But if the blockage is removed after, say, 12 hours or 14 hours, 
then a lot of damage would have already been done and some benefit you may get but not great so opening the artery as soon as possible is extremely important and it is done as you may know by two methods one is by injecting a clot dissolving drug and second is by balloon angioplasty in an emergency sometimes we do both if there is a delayed angioplasty we give the injection first and then do the angioplasty but if there is no delay then angioplasty is a better method to open the artery so if the artery is, is opened in time the damage is very minimum and a lot of muscle is saved as you can see the yellow portion is the heart muscle and it is as good as normal and that also prevents complications like heart enlargement or thinning of the heart muscle wall etc so to summarize for a heart attack the problem is blockage of an artery which causes death of a portion of a heart muscle which causes chest pain the important thing is to recognize it early and to act in minutes so as to hospitalize the patient and open the artery as soon as possible so as relatives of patients or neighbors or lay people or non medical people the two things that are important for us are to recognize it early and to act within minutes so how do we recognize a heart attack the question i have asked is heart attack starts as severe pain in chest is it true or false but it's not true in most cases heart attack starts as a mild or moderate discomfort which increases in severity and lasts for more than 15 minutes if the pain lasts less than 5 minutes and goes away it could be a warning sign but not a heart attack so when somebody has discomfort which continues for more than 15 minutes it could be a heart attack it starts at a moderate intensity but increases in severity and what does it feel like usually it is uncomfortable pressure squeezing fullness tightness burning heaviness etc the person has difficulty in breathing it, he feels there is a tight bear hug or an elephant on the chest there may be sweating vomiting pale gray cool skin less commonly in some female especially they get little unusual symptoms like gas or lump in the chest indigestion or burning like acidity but any unusual symptom which is makes you uncomfortable last for more than 15 minutes uh should be noted and reported and where does this discomfort occur most commonly in the center of the chest either side or both sides but sometimes it can radiate upwards or to the shoulders or to the lower upper abdomen sometimes it can start only at the back or the shoulders or the arms so anywhere between the navel and the ears and between the two arms is the location of heart attack pain so supposing you have headache then it is not a heart attack pain or you have pain in the lower abdomen or thighs or legs then it is not a heart attack so heart attack pain is usually between the navel and the ears the jaws throat neck etc but most common in the chest so this should be noted and what do we do what is the action we take don't waste more than few minutes inform your family member your family doctor but don't wait for your doctor call a cardiac ambulance but if a cardiac ambulance is going to take time in our city because of traffic etc be taken to a hospital tell somebody to take you and it could be in a taxi even in a rickshaw or in a car just go to the hospital if the cardiac ambulance is going to take time so within few minutes you should be in the hospital and while going if you have soluble aspirin it is good to chew this aspirin if you are not known to have any side effect or allergy to aspirin so in the houses it is always better to keep a soluble aspirin at home if your blood pressure is known or it is taken at that time and it is normal you could take a nitroglycerin tablet under the tongue but if you don't know your blood pressure better not to take it but better to take aspirin so in short recognize the symptoms and rush to the hospital that is the uh, moral of the story of heart attack
Now, one more question is, do patients of heart attack get a warning sign hours, days, or weeks before the attack? Well, 50% of patients of heart attack have some warning which lasts for 5-10 minutes and just goes away. If that is reported, it is a great moment of opportunity. If that is reported and treated well, then uh, the heart attack which could have come is totally aborted. So this is an important fact that one must know that if there is a warning sign which lasts five to 10 minutes, you must report it. Now let us come to prevention. What percentage of heart attacks are preventable? 30%, 75, 90 or 100%? Well, there was a very interesting study some years ago, recently, uh, uh, which was called the Interheart Study. And it found that there were, it did a study in 52 countries and various populations and found that there were nine factors which were responsible for 90% of heart attacks. So if these nine factors, which are all correctable, can be corrected, we can prevent 90% of heart attacks. And out of these 90%, 50% are explained by diet and exercise, simple. So a lot of heart attacks can be prevented. Now, how do we do that? So I thought of a three step formula for this. It's very simple to remember. A few measurements, few changes in lifestyle or our habits and few pills. So what are the measurements? Blood pressure, blood sugar, lipids, obesity, especially the abdominal obesity and cardiovascular fitness. So these are the things that one must check. Okay. So what are the target levels that we shall see because reaching the targets is important to prevent heart disease. So the ideal blood pressure to have is less than 130 by 80 or as near 120 by 80 as possible. And which is done at home or after repeated measurements in the clinic. One must remember, don't depend only on one reading. And also, uh, it is better if you are suspected to have hypertension or you have confirmed hypertension, it is better to have a BP instrument at home and check blood pressure yourself at home and see how it is as compared to 130 by 80 or 120 by 90, 120 by 80. Blood sugar, fasting should be less than 100, two hours after lunch, less than 140, HbA1c, which gives you an average of about three months blood sugar, it should be less than 5.9%. Cholesterol, what is the normal level of cholesterol? Well, one important thing is, uh, I shall describe by this experience of many patients. This was this patient, is a real report of a patient in whom uh, angioplasty was done by me a few months ago. And he came with the cholesterol report and he told me, doc, this cholesterol, cholesterol looks to be normal. I said, where is it? Okay. He said, see, the normal range of LDL cholesterol is 150 and mine is 105, well within the normal range. So this is a mistake which unfortunately many people make and we have been telling many labs also not to do this, not to write this normal range. This is for the simple reason that there is nothing like a normal for all, but there is something called desirable levels for an individual, which varies from person to person, depending on his overall risk. And overall risk, the, the doctors decide by whether the person has had coronary disease before, like this patient of mine, or whether his LDL cholesterol is more than 190, or whether it's all these factors together or individually, like diabetes, hypertension, kidney disease, age, et cetera, physical inactivity, a lot of factors. So we consider all these factors and we judge whether this patient is at high risk, very high risk or moderate risk. So if the patient is at very high risk, we want his LDL cholesterol to be less than 55. So this is a desirable level. So there's nothing like normal. If he's at high risk, we want it to be less than 70. LDL cholesterol I'm talking about, because that is our target most of the times. Moderate risk patient can be about less than 100 and low risk less than 116. So for an average uh, healthy person, 
Uh, in general, we recommend that the total cholesterol remains less than 200, LDL cholesterol less than 100, HDL more than 50, triglycerides more than uh, less than 150, and non-HDLC, which is simple subtraction of non-cholesterol, total cholesterol, uh, and HDL cholesterol should be less, uh, less than 130. Okay. So this is about cholesterol. Obesity. Obesity is measured as a body mass index, which is calculated by weight in kilograms divided by height in meters squared. And the, it gives a rough idea of obesity. It's not a very, uh, the better way to judge obesity is this, the waist circumference and the ratio of weight, waist and hip. If your waist circumference is equal to hip or more than hip, it is not a good thing. It should be less, always less than the hip circumference. And the target levels are, in males, it should be less than 35 inches, in females, less than 31 inches. And the ratio in males should be less than 0.9, in females should be less than 0.8. So in general, the waist has to be less than the hip. That is a healthy uh, waist hip ratio. Then another measure uh, that we uh, take into consideration is a walking speed or a cardiovascular fitness which is very easily judged by walking speed. Many times people have a very slow walking speed, which can be increased. And that suggests uh, uh, low fitness levels, unless of course there are some problems like joint pains in the knees and hip and et cetera, which of course should be corrected. And the walking speed should be increased. So uh, we have found the walking speed to be related to cardiovascular mortality in future. And one of the interesting thing is that life purpose is one of the determinants of walking speed. As you can see, Gandhiji was one of the supreme examples. And I'm sure a lot of Rotarians have this increased life purpose and I'm sure they are walking fast. So walking speed is very important and can be increased. So summarizing all the measurements, blood pressure, blood sugar, lipids, obesity, especially the abdominal obesity, the waistline, and cardiovascular fitness. There are some additional tests that can be done which your doctor can advise. And one of these tests nowadays we do is known as coronary artery calcium score. And this is a CT scan of the chest in which the deposits of calcium in your heart are measured. And if these deposits are say zero for a person who is above the age of 55 or 60, it is a very good sign. This sign is not very reliable in younger people because younger people can have a calcium score which is zero, yet they can have blockages. It is a good test. And if the calcium score is high, say more than 100, 300, it means that you have calcium deposits in your arteries. That means already some deposits of cholesterol have started happening and you have to be careful with your lifestyle and maybe require medications. <laughs> So this is all about measurements and a few lifestyle changes. Of course, smoking, the most important thing. And the simple treatment this doctor is advising to is to wear a patch. Uh, there was some, some uh, news about using e-cigarettes, but they are highly not recommended because they have serious side effects on the lungs. So don't use them as a means to stop smoking. I think it's just the mental determination which should be used to stop smoking. What about diet? This uh, news is just a few days old and there's a big study done on lots of people. And it was found that the anti-inflammatory diet is the chief mantra. Diet it does not cause inflammation in the body. And usually these are the plant-based diets or the Mediterranean diets rich in fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, legumes, whole grain, olive oil, and seafood and light on dairy and processed meat. So one should avoid pro-inflammatory foodstuffs like refined carbohydrates, refined starch, simple sugars like sugary drinks, trans fats, etc. So diet is a simple thing. One has to remember that Mediterranean or plant-based diets are the best. Now, exercise, regular, moderately vigorous and aerobic exercise. And exercise is medicine. Just like medicine, it cuts down the risk of heart attack by 50%. The benefits start whatever age you start, like any medicine. 
the benefits start as long as you do it as long as you take a medicine it helps you stop the medicine uh, you start getting problems so medicine has to be taken regularly in the same way exercise also regularly and uh, uh, also the exercise if when overdone can have toxic effects so that also one must remember not to overdo it now what is the measure of moderately vigorous aerobic exercise where it is simply known as a fit principle the frequency should be 5 to 7 times a week the intensity should be such that you should just be able to talk but not sing if you walk and you can sing along then you are not doing intense exercise enough it should be so intense that you can just whisper or talk but not continuously talk so that is a very rough way to know the intensity and this intensity should be maintained for at least 30 minutes there should be not not too many breaks in this intensity so that causes cardiovascular conditioning if you do it properly continuously for 30 minutes and the type of exercise exercise examples are walking cycling swimming skipping etc sometimes people ask the question doc i am walking in the house is that adequate exercise well it is exercise to some extent if you can't do anything else but it is not very adequate because when you reach the end of your house you are going to take a turn and slow down so frequently you have to slow down while you are walking and that cuts down your heart rate your heart rate has to be maintained at a higher level at a some intensity as i discussed and that gives you cardiovascular conditioning so walking in the house is not adequate exercise uh unless i mean right now in the lockdown period there is no other go but of course one can do a lot of other things like climbing stairs etc so uh, now there are other enemies under our nose that escape our attention for example sleeping less and this is especially dangerous if you do vigorous exercise so if you are going to do a vigorous exercise see that you have slept well the day you have not slept well please don't do vigorous exercise because sleeping less releases toxins in the body which can harm you along with the vigorous exercise sitting more sitting of course is a disease that is for us we are all kind of indulging in it because of our tv computers uh, cars etc and uh, it is said that 8 hours of sitting all the bad effects can be removed by one hour of walking so uh, if you walk for an hour but sit for 8 hours then uh, you don't gain much so that is why we emphasize this what is known as neat that is non exercise activity thermogenesis that means uh, physical activity when you are not exercising so besides your half an hour or one hour of walking during the day during your op- occupation or in your household chores please see that you don't sit too much and walk or stand as much as possible not having proper breakfast is also a risk factor because people who don't have breakfast they are known to have higher incidence of heart attacks and this probably is because when they skip breakfast they have a heavy lunch which could which may be may not be very healthy and that is what happens late dinners also is a little danger because late dinners means heavy food and uh, that could be dangerous then of course emotional stress is a very big risk factor and uh, it is uh, everybody has to choose his own way or select or this or find his own way to reduce stress with relaxation and sleep physical exercise yoga and meditation spiritual literature those meaningful relationships very important altruism and a sense of purpose in life which the rotarians are having in plenty uh, and which i think which is a very great thing in preventing heart disease in rotarians i think and finally three pills a few pills and out of these pills i feel the statins are the most important aspirin are not important are not uh, kind of uh, useful for everybody but some some people can be used and of course pills if required for hypertension and diabetes under medical guidance now statins some people are little afraid because there could be some risk of taking statins so the best thing is to discuss the risk benefit uh, Uh, ratio with your uh, by conversing with your own doctor and in general uh, you should know that it statins not only reduce the blood level of cholesterol but stabilize the the cholesterol or the fatty plaque which is in your arteries 
And for example, this artery, if uh, cholesterol, is, if statin drugs are not taken and the person is vulnerable, the fatty plaques can increase. Whereas if a high dose statin is taken, the fatty plaques, plaques regress and stabilize and do not rupture. And hence statins are extremely good drugs and can be taken, but after consulting your doctor. So prevention with three steps, few measurements, few lifestyle changes, few pills, which will probably help prevent 90% of heart attacks. And for the others who may still get a heart attack, early recognition and prompt treatment will save them from complication and damage to the heart muscle. So as you can see, if you take preventive steps and note the warning symptoms, I think you can all, we can all escape from the problem of heart attack. So that is the message today. Now coming back uh, a few slides for our friends who suddenly collapsed. It's known as cardiac arrest, which is different from a heart attack. Heart attack, as you saw, was due to a blocked artery. Cardiac arrest is due to electrical failure. The heart failed as a pump because of the electricity has gone. And, and because the heart fails as a pump, the whole body does not get blood and the brain is the first to suffer. And is cardiac arrest preventable? Unfortunately, not as much as a heart attack because more than half of patients with cardiac arrest do not have any symptoms and just suddenly collapse. So it's very difficult to prevent it. But the main thing is it can be treated. And how it can be treated? First thing is to recognize a cardiac arrest. First thing is that if you witness a person suddenly collapse for no apparent reason, and if the person is not responsive to your shouting or shaking both the shoulders, and he's not breathing. So the thing is that you have to shake the person and see if he's breathing. If he's breathing, it is not cardiac arrest. It could be something else, something like hypoglycemia or a common faint or something. But if he's not breathing, which you should not watch, you must watch for more than five seconds. And if you can take a pulse, but don't waste too much time on taking a pulse. If he's not breathing and not responding, it's very likely a cardiac arrest and you have to act. And what you have to do is the first thing is to call for help. And call for help means either a cardiac ambulance or a AED, automated external defibrillators, which you must have seen at the airports. So call for these things. So first thing is to call. And by the time these things come, start doing proper cardiac massage. And this fortunately does not require mouth to mouth breathing now. All you require is a proper chest compression which of course details we can show in a different kind of talk. But this is what you have to do. And when the defibrillator comes, you can give a shock. And this can be used by lay persons also because it has prompts which can guide you as to what to do. And once a shock is given, if the patient wakes up and is alive, you have done the miracle. If not, then continue massage and give another shock after a few minutes. So massage, shock, massage, shock should continue till the patient regains consciousness or if the uh, expert help comes. So to summarize, heart attack is a problem of pipes or the blocked artery, whereas cardiac arrest is the electrical failure. In a heart attack, there is chest pain. In a cardiac arrest, there is collapse of the person. And what is the treatment in a heart attack? Open the artery by going fast to the hospital, taking aspirin on the way. Whereas treatment of cardiac arrest is start CPR and give a shock. So what is required is knowledge of CPR and institution of an availability of AEDs, which should be available on the spot. So the treatment is on the spot. One mistake many people make is in cardiac arrest is because we are afraid, we don't know what to do. We tell, we tell the, everybody, Chalo, let the, take the patient to the hospital. And unless the hospital is just one minute away, which is very, very rare, most of the time hospital is 10, 15, half an hour away. And if you transport the patient, CPR is not possible in the, in the ambulance, most probably by lay people. And by the 10 minutes, 15 minutes, we have lost the patient and patient is dead on arrival in the hospital. So when there is cardiac arrest, don't be in a hurry to go to the hospital. Please start CPR and use AED. So as Rotarians also, I think knowledge of CPR and AED should be an establishment of AEDs. For example, in Bandra, 
Uh, about 20, 25 ADs have, have been established by the Holy Family Hospital. And uh, this should be spread all over the uh, city and of course the country. Then the cardiac arrest patients can be uh, revived uh, and uh, can be helped. So the take home messages are almost 90% of heart attacks are preventable with the help of this three step formula. If at all it occurs, recognize a symptom and rush to the hospital to prevent damage to the heart. If cardiac arrest is there, recognize and act on the spot. So knowledge of CPR and availability of AED is a great need in society. And of course, more things that are discussed in the book. If anybody requires the book, please uh, inform President Vicky and he'll give that get back to me. And thank you very much for this great opportunity given to me. I hope uh, it has made some, some things clear and uh, hope it helps uh, you in some way or the other. Thank you very much. And thanks again, uh, Vicky and Nikki, my good friends for uh, calling me and sharing my thoughts with you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mehta. That was fabulous. So extensive, so deep. I mean, we are really honored you did your book launch with us, you know. But before I proceed further and uh, take it to question and answer, I want to welcome DG Sunil Mehra for joining us today and uh, hi, hi, honoring us. Uh, uh, can hi. we have the spotlight on him? No, sir, it's okay. Uh, Vicky, just carry on. It's okay. Don't worry. I'm here. Hi, everybody. You'll have to stop no, the no, screen no. sharing. I recognize your voice, but the club will not believe me that you're here. I'm you mentioning know? my voice. Manoj, carry on with the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, DG uh, Sunil ji. Thanks for coming. Dr. Akshay, very detailed the particular uh, presentation you gave us. Thank you. And uh, honestly, romancing the heart to a person of 21 years is a different connotation. <laughs> <laughs> 61 years is a different connotation. Correct. Great, but right. great insight. Thank you. Thank you for yes, being uh, here. Yes, I, I, I made an announcement, DG, that uh, in our club, and I was hoping you were there to he hear it. And I would like to repeat it, that our members have generously come forward and donated to the cause of uh, the polio fund to eradicate polio from the world. And uh, in one week itself, we have had uh, more than 64 Paul Harris uh, uh, recognitions. And uh, contributions exceeding $21,000, you know? Yeah. So that is wonderful, uh, Vicky. And uh, thank you so much for supporting the foundation and the polio movement. But of course, that little birdie came in the morning and gave me that note also. Therefore, I said, let me be here and say, Congratulations to the entire club for supporting the cause of polio. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, we, yeah, thank you. It is all your guidance and support and that we are encouraged to do all this. You know? It's Rotarians who do all the work. So Thank you. So we will uh, head to the question answer from now. Uh, now, uh, uh, may I ask the first question? Uh, sure. You know, uh, doctor, uh, what do you, uh, are there any preventive tests that we can do to ensure that we don't uh, have a sudden heart attack uh, possible, you know, chance of a sudden heart attack uh, and then run into, you know, preventive measures, uh, some, some kind of advanced testing can we do? That's a great right. question. Yeah, uh, this is always, this is always in the minds of people that how do I know whether I have blockages or whether I'm at high risk? So as I said, uh, the basic tests are, of course, for sugar, for lipid profile, for blood pressure, your waistline, your fitness levels. These are simple tests. Blood pressure comparison in both the arms and comparison between arm and leg is a very simple test, which can denote, we can tell you whether you have already blockages in your arteries or not. Because normally blood pressure difference between the arms should be less than 10 and between the arm and leg also should be less than 15 to 20 should not be more or the leg pressure should always be higher than the arm pressure. If it is equal to the arm pressure or less than the arm pressure, it denotes already blockages have started developing. So these are simple tests. Then of course, more advanced tests. Now going from simple to advanced, how do we judge? We judge depending on the profile of the patient, like a patient who has a family history of heart disease or a patient who has multiple risk factors already like hypertension, diabetes, smoking, etc. So, so different patients, we go to a different levels of examination. For example, there could be some patient who has so many risk factors and 
he's sedentary. We don't know. Uh, he may not be able to do a stress test. Sometimes we do a stress test to judge. Uh, we may have to do what is known as CT angiography. So CT angiography is a simple test in which dye is injected and the arteries are seen uh, non-invasively. The problem with CT angiography is there are two problems. We don't uh, advocate it for everybody. Uh, the problem with CT angiography is that you are exposed to radiation. That is one. And second thing is if your kidneys are kind of borderline functioning, then it may, we may damage your kidney also by injecting the dye. So we are careful in selecting which tests to be done for which patient. So it's not uh, one size fit for all. And uh, depending on your risk levels, these are the tests. And as I mentioned also, there are some blood tests which nowadays we do. Uh, one very important blood test is called as high sensitivity yeah. troponins. And when we combine your risk factors with high sensitivity troponin, which is a simple blood test, and then do what is known as calcium score of coronary arteries. That is another test that can be done. If uh, all these tests are abnormal, your HS tropi, troponin is high, your calcium score is high, then you are at high risk. Then many times we, besides lifestyle changes, we also advise you to take medications like statins. So, so uh, summarizing various laboratory tests, various tests on physical examination and major specialized tests like troponin, calcium score, CT calcium score, in which dye is not injected, you are just doing a CT score scan. So these tests can help decide whether you already have disease or you are at high risk of having disease. If your calcium score is high, more than 100, then you are at high risk of having problems. Can I just interrupt for a minute? Sure. I'm Dr. Vadira, and I am doing this HS troponin I. And now the Abbott has started doing HS troponin I as a risk stratification, which you can do on people coming in the for health checkups. And then you can give a probability uh, as a percentage as to when you can get these. Uh, right. Means what is your susceptibility to cardiac disease, and um, that helps. So we are doing this uh, risk stratification. Yes, yes. And we are advising also many patients and uh, many people rather. And when you combine them with combine this test, see, basically uh, not, not every test is kind of independently. It has to be matched with other things. So when this test is matched with say calcium score, with say sugar levels, et cetera, we give a better idea of the risk of Correct. the patient. Yes, absolutely. Uh, there's a question from uh, Aditi Choksi. Yes. Who is a four-way test uh, chairperson. What is a stroke? Simple. Yes, is stroke, stroke? Uh, is a brain stroke usually. And the pathology is very similar to a heart attack. Blockage of the brain arteries due to fat deposits and there a plaque formation and a blockage. And the treatment is also similar, by the way. The, the One of the common treatment given is if you are reached the hospital very early, within say uh, two hours or three hours, then uh, a clot dissolving drug, which we give for heart attack patients can also be given for brain attack people. And he can be, or she can be um, protected from a permanent disability like a para So reaching a hospital in a stroke patient is also very important. Sometimes they don't inject drug, but they put a catheter inside the brain arteries and remove the blockage that is there. So, so these are very important things that, so that's why many hospitals now have a stroke unit, which is dedicated to this kind of treatment. So in case you have weakness of the face or arms or cannot speak properly, you must recognize that this is stroke and uh, send the patient to the hospital as fast as possible. So stroke is a brain attack, yeah. Thank you, doctor. Uh, we have a question from Geeta Parekh. What is more dangerous, heart attack or cardiac arrest? Yes, very good question. I think cardiac arrest is definitely more dangerous because, uh, as I said, heart attack can be treated if you reach in time. Your heart can be saved and you can be saved. But cardiac arrest, the mortality rates are more than 90%. That means if a person has cardiac arrest, out of 100 cardiac arrest victims all over the world, less than 
ten people can be saved to a fully normal functioning life. So, of course, it varies from city to city. In some advanced countries where CPR can be given early, AED is available very fast. There, almost 40 to 50 percent survival is found. But in a country like ours, I would feel 95 percent uh, mortality is there in cardiac arrest. So, cardiac arrest is more dangerous, definitely. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, any more questions? Uh, yeah, from, can, I, uh, can I ask, Vicky? Yes, Jamshid, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, Doctor, you have mentioned in all these cases, the key is to try and get the patient to the hospital as soon as possible. Now, getting the patient to the hospital is, of course, has its own challenges. But once you reach the hospital, how, how easy is it for a lay person to, you know, get the hospital to act on the patient then? See, every hospital has an emergency department. So once you reach the emergency department, the basic things are done in the hospital, like uh, taking a cardiogram. Uh, if the person does not understand a cardiogram, fortunately with yeah, now WhatsApp and all cardiograms are sent miles away and opinions taken. Treatment can be started like aspirin, a clot dissolving drug, other blood thinners, etc., cetera, uh, intravenous uh, fluids. So things can be started. So treatment, starting treatment early is very important. If the hospital does not have facility for angioplasty, now this I'm talking about a heart attack, not cardiac arrest. In cardiac arrest, I would again re-emphasize, don't rush to the hospital first. Treat the patient there and there. For It is for heart attack people who have chest pain who are conscious, who can talk, rush them to the hospital. And over there, either drugs can be given or angioplasty can be done, or both can be done. So reach the emergency unit of the hospital and emergency units all know what to do for a patient of chest pain because they are doing this day in and day out. And this is the important thing is to go to the hospital. Another advantage of reaching the hospital early is that 25% of heart attack victims who are conscious, who are talking, on the way can get a cardiac arrest. But if you reach the hospital early and the cardiac arrest occurs in the hospital, it is much easily treatable and almost totally reversible. So if you get a cardiac arrest, better you get it in the hospital. And for that, you must reach the hospital early. So the, again, the moral of the story is heart attack, chest pain, reach the hospital. Go in a rickshaw also, doesn't matter, but go to the hospital. Thank you, doctor. Right. Uh, next question. What is the full form of CPR and AED? Yes, good. <clears throat> CPR is cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And uh, in olden days, I mean, this is actually a old terminology. Now it is no more called CPR, it is called CCR, cardiocerebral resuscitation. Because what you are doing is you are reviving the, the brain. The brain is requiring blood. And it is chest compression only. So this, we don't give importance much to the lungs because lungs will take care of themselves. And uh, once the patient starts breathing. But uh, CPR is actually CCR. That is one. And mouth to mouth breathing, as I told you, is not required. So it's much easier for people. And the second thing is AED is automated external defibrillators. These are automated. So anybody can use it. Just listen to the prompts, switch it on. It will say, apply the pads. It will tell you, uh, stand stand away from the patient because it is analyzing. Then it will say, press the button to give a shock. So you press a button, you give a shock, you give life to the patient just by pressing a button. So this can be learned. And uh, I think, and I, I mean, um, we can, as Rotarians, we can do a lot of things for this, for teaching people about uh, resuscitation, CPR and using AEDs. The AEDs, if you can see, are available at the airports. And uh, I think we should have them more uh, in the community. Can you, uh, uh, thank you, doctor. Can you clear the air upon uh, the cholesterol levels? They keep changing the levels and telling <laughs> us this. Yeah, as I said, it depends on the, the risk or how much risk that patient is of having future heart attack. If a person already has had blockages, say heart attack in the past, angioplasty done, bypass surgery done, he's at a very high risk. And for him, we want the LDL cholesterol to be as near 55 or below 55 as possible. 
whereas in a healthy person who say at the age of 45 50 is walking about he has no family history no other risk factors if it is less than 100 ldl this i am talking about ldl not total cholesterol if his ldl is less than 100 it is fine but then the the lifestyle has to be maintained if is if it is he is a medium risk then less than 75 80 should be the ldl cholesterol so the goal differs according to the risk of the person and that risk you can kind of converse with your doctor and find out mostly uh, uh, ldl is that that but that is to be so that is what we yeah because that has highest correlation with coronary artery disease okay doctor what is the cost of aed Uh, I think about it, there are two three varieties. It varies from eighty thousand to about one lakh. Each AED, and okay, the pads okay. that come, that pads once they are used, you have to replace them. So they cost some three thousand rupees or something. And the battery life is about five years. Rechargeable battery. Okay. Any further questions? Last question, then from my side, doctor. You have given yeah. solution for hard, uh, hard uh, and yes. Anybody yeah, else? Can I can I ask a question? Ashwin, please yes. go ahead. Yeah, uh, doctor, I just want to know about uh, if if there's a problem in the carotid artery and the blockage, how yes. dangerous is that? Yes, the carotid arteries are the lifelines to the brain, just as coronary arteries are lifeline to the heart. So carotid arteries are lying in the neck, going up to the brain. and the blockages depend on the severity and also on symptoms if you don't have symptoms and you have blockage up to 50 70% medication should be fine and again all lifestyle changes a healthy lifestyle diet medicines like statins etc should be taken but if you have symptoms and blockage is very severe then you may need to do something like sometimes uh, we advise angioplasty and stenting of the carotid arteries also and uh, so that could be done um, so it depends on your symptoms and the severity of the arteries uh, blockages in the artery can Thank i ask one last question vicky please aditi yes sure go ahead uh, what is nt pro bnp test okay nt pro bnp test is a blood test to know <coughs> whether your heart is under strain for example a common condition of heart is known as heart failure which could be due to diminished pumping capacity of the heart or inability of the heart to relax and that causes a backlog in the lungs and congestion and the person complains of breathlessness or swelling in the body so this is known as heart failure and one of the most important diagnostic tests for heart failure is this test called nt pro bnp and these are known as uh, these are brain uh, these are known as a uh, uh, natriuretic peptides which are some chemicals in the blood which gets released when the heart is at strain and this is a very important test that we do nowadays for patient with heart failure again this is also a test like uh, drop troponins for even normal individuals uh, mm. it can be done to know whether there is a stress on the heart or not but uh, usually it is done when we suspect expect heart failure so it can be controlled with medication yes yeah. yes definitely in fact it is a good guide to medications and uh, by giving medications we bring it down to normal levels which uh, also benefits the patient thank you doctor thank you uh, may thank i ask you, a question could i please ask